Uh, but I want to let you know up front that uh, of all the stories in Genesis, I think today is, is the most wild. Um, you, you read it and you think there's no way this can be real, but it's real. Um, as we get into this, it honestly, it, it feels more like one of those uh, Netflix real-life drama, you know, videos than it does uh, the actual text of the Bible, but, but it is the, the text of the Bible. It's just a wild ride, and it's all about a man named Joseph. And before we get into the text, I want you to know that as we go through it, there's, there's a lot of moments in life where we won't experience what Joseph experienced. Like, we're not going to experience a lot of those uh, events, but when we look at how those events pulled on his, his, his mind and the way those events pulled on his heart, we can look and say, now, I understand those emotions. I may not go through what he's gone through, but, but the emotions that, that he feels, that meets me right where I am today. Honestly, as I, as I read through the, the book of Joseph the past couple weeks, or, or the story of Joseph, um, it's one of the reasons I know the Bible is, is real. Because it's a story from thousands and thousands of years ago. When you look at what Joseph and I have in common, it's not a lot. What you and Joseph have in common, it's, it's not a lot. But the way that his story meets where our heart is at, it tells me that Scripture is, is holy and it's active. It's not this old dusty fairy tale. Now, Joseph's story, it does span 13 chapters, the last 13 chapters of the book of Genesis. And there's a lot of moments in his life where we could take a, a lesson here or there, lessons that would be different as they apply to our lives. But instead, what we're going to do today is we're going to go through hit and, hit and miss on all 13 chapters and really look at the overarching theme of what Joseph is going through. And so here's the way his story begins. It says, this is the account of Jacob and his family. When Joseph was 17 years old, he often tended his father's flocks. He worked for his half-brothers, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. But Joseph reported to his father some of the bad things that his brothers were doing. So, so two things we know about Joseph right off the bat is that he's this 17-year-old teenage boy, right? And, and he seems to have this growing, contentious relationship with his older brothers. And as we continue in the next few verses, we find why he has this growing, contentious relationship. Verse 3, Jacob, the father, loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. So, so Joseph is one of the babies of the family, and, and he plays that role really well by telling on his older brothers all of the time. Uh, not only is he his dad's favorite, and his dad's, the text just says, I, I, I love him more than the rest of you. That's what Jacob is doing. I, I mean, we all have our children we love more than the rest, but we don't say it. Oh, oh, I'm just kidding. That's, but, but Jacob's really blunt about it, even to the extent that he says, look, here's this beautiful robe. It's, you know, it's, it's all these different colors. And, and, and he wants Joseph to wear this and, and parade around all of his older siblings. And, and even if we didn't know that Joseph was one of the family's youngest, if the Bible didn't flat out tell us he was, uh, we can tell by how naive he is about being spoiled. Listen to this. It says, it says, one night, Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. Like, brothers, can you believe this, right? Like, and then naive as can be, the Bible says that Joseph doesn't just do it once. He goes back and he does it a second time. He says, brothers, come here, listen, got something to tell you. You're not going to believe this. Crazy wild dream I had last night, but y'all are still worshiping me. Ain't that something, right? Like, and he just keeps telling them over and over. Now, it's important that we don't understand, we don't know Joseph's intent here, right? You can take it one of two ways and think he's being a little arrogant. He knows he's spoiled. He knows he's the favorite, right? But, but scholars really think that Joseph is pretty pure in this, um, that he's pretty innocent and he looks up to his brothers and he's just saying, guys, what do you think this means? You know, he does, it's not his fault he's the favorite. It's not his, his fault he's spoiled. And so if you are reading intent into this, we, we do want to read more of kind of an innocence intent, now, sometime later, the older boys are working out in the field, and it says, when Joseph's brothers saw him coming, they recognized him in the distance. It's, it's probably the rope. And as he approached, they made plans to kill him. 
Here comes the dreamer, they said. Come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns. We can tell our father a wild animal has eaten him. Then we'll see what becomes of his dreams. It's a pretty dramatic response from a lot of things that are outside of Joseph's control. They, they, they want to kill him and just throw him in this empty well and, and just leave him. They're going to lie to dad about it. Now, it all seems like madness, but thankfully, one of the other older brothers chimes in and says, guys, what are you even thinking? We don't want blood on our hands. We don't have to kill him. Just throw him in the well. He'll die eventually. And that's what they do. And then another brother comes up and says, what are we, guys, this is absolute madness. What are you thinking? Like, you, you, we're not going to kill our brother. We're not going to leave him in a well to, to die. We're going to sell him to those traitors who are coming this way right now. And that's exactly what they do. They, they, they sell Joseph, their young, one of their youngest brothers, to traitors who are heading towards Egypt. Uh, and if you match up the currency, they sold him for $200. Now, it's worth mentioning, if, if all of this seems like madness to you, and, and you're, you're wondering, you know, how could anybody do that to one of the babies of the family, right? If you're reading this and you don't see it coming, you're one of the babies in your family. That's, that's the problem here. Um, there's a good chance that your brothers and sisters thought this of you. Um, I've got three kids, Ezra five, Evelyn three, and Judah is, is two, and they say things about two-year-olds, and it's true. And uh, just this week, my daughter had enough, and, and she asked if she could talk with me, and she held my hand, and led me away to be alone with her, and she looked at me with her, her deep brown eyes and said, can we take Judah back? Um, your family thought that about you if you're the youngest. Now, if, if you're not the, the youngest and you are the oldest, you're thinking $200, what a deal. Like, you would have you, you let yours probably go for, for much less, and that's okay, right? But all kidding aside, you know, we have to think about this from, from Joseph's perspective. And once again, you know, he's probably been pretty innocent in all of this. And when you, you, you think about Joseph's circumstances and how he's been treated and, and, and where he finds himself now, Probably the one word that best describes Joseph is, is hopeless. That's probably the most accurate, is hopeless. In, in Joseph's upbringing and, and in that culture, family was absolutely everything. Family was, was irreplaceable. And to, to have a, a, a fractured family, as we've seen happen here and there through Genesis, it was a pretty dramatic thing. And for Joseph, I think that family mattered even more. Uh, his, his family was a, a group of shepherds, so they were nomadic, so, so they had been just wandering the countryside, living off the land. Uh, family was, was everything for Joseph. And family was, was all he had. And so when you think about Joseph, when he loses his family, he loses everything. I have a buddy in Wisconsin, we were, we were messaging last night, uh, he just lost his, his mom and, and it seems like he's going to lose his dad to a disease on the horizon and we were talking about just the impact when we lose somebody close to us, like when we lose family. You know, that's not something that you just get through. You don't just move on from a loss like that. Joseph doesn't just move on from a loss like that. Grief is this weight that we just kind of learn to move with the rest of our lives. And can you imagine the, the look on Joseph's face when he sees his brothers strike a deal to sell him like a piece of merchandise? Just the look of, of shock and sadness and, and terror. As, he, as he's looking at them, just staring at them, I can't believe you're doing this to me as he's chained in shackles and, and, and strung up to a wagon. And for 30 days, he would have to walk behind that wagon through the desert, just trying to wrap his mind around how him as this God-fearing young man, how the worst-case scenario can come true. He has to be thinking, how did this happen? And once he, he arrived in Egypt, he would be uh, sold off to a, a powerful Egyptian politician named Potiphar. And as Joseph would go through his new life in Egypt, everything about this new life in Egypt would have reminded him of his painful past. The bustling city, he's not used to that. This language that he doesn't speak, 
the, the, the mighty pyramids. I mean, everything would have reminded Joseph of his painful past. But as we know, that painful past, if we don't deal with it, it has a way of coming in and making a painful present. Now, we may not experience what Joseph has experienced. We may not have that exact experience, but there, there, there will be times in our life when we experience those emotions. In John 16, it's one of our least favorite promises in all of the Bible. Jesus tells us, He says, in this world, you will have trouble. And if Jesus promised it, then you and I as followers of Jesus can, can count on it. And Sunday mornings, it really isn't the most comfortable time to discuss how following Jesus, it doesn't keep us immune to things like hopelessness. It doesn't keep us away from things like heartache. It doesn't even protect us from the worst case scenarios. But we know it's true. Life can get sideways. Life can leave us hopeless. Life can break our hearts. And unfortunately, Worst-case scenario can come true. And at our best in those moments, we're left wondering where God is in all of it. Sometimes life can be so hard that, that, that we run away from God altogether. Or we'll choose to stay around Him in, in settings like a Sunday morning, even though we don't like Him due to the circumstances He has put or one day placed in our lives, even if it's in the distant past. And there's nothing supernatural about Joseph. As we'll see in his story, he is so human just like we are human. And this is what he'd be wrestling with in this moment. He'd have questions about his life like you have questions about your life when things go wrong. He'd have questions about God like we have questions about God when things go wrong. He'd be wondering, you know, what's he supposed to do in this valley of life? He'd be asking God, are are these, the, the, the circumstances I'm going through, is this somehow like a reflection of, of how you feel about me? Did I do something wrong? Did I not pray enough? Are you punishing me, God? Are you punishing me with all of this pain? But despite his circumstances that would beg otherwise, chapter 39 opens with these words. The Lord was with Joseph. Despite all the bad, the Lord was with Joseph. Despite circumstances that would beg otherwise, the Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. In just a few short, short chapters, we see that Joseph was abandoned by his family. He was divided from everything he ever knew. Yet somehow, some way, he was never abandoned by God. And Joseph may not have understood it at the time, but his circumstances were not a reflection of how God felt about him. It's not even close. And just some short time after Joseph was finding favor with his Egyptian master, Potiphar, another punch comes Joseph's way. Uh, he is falsely a, a accused of a crime by his master's wife, and somehow, some way, if, if Joseph's story hadn't gotten bad enough, he now finds himself in jail. It's one of those moments where you think it can't get any worse than it does. It's one of those moments where you, you think the valley can't be uh, any deeper, and somehow, some way, it, it lowers. We like to say, when, when it rains, it pours. But the truth is, sometimes when it pours, it floods. And so sitting in that prison cell with, with certainly a death sentence tagged to his name, Joseph has to be wondering, God, are, are you still with me? God, there's a lot of bad. Are you still good? Have you forgotten about me? Now, we may not have that experience, but there have been, or I promise you, there will be times in our life when we have those emotions too. Moments where we say we're, we're following Jesus, we're trying to do all the right things, but it seems like the punches keep coming. Moments when we wonder, like, can it really get any worse? And it does. 
These moments we, we look up at the sky and, and all we can say is why. Why? And in those moments, you and I will be tempted to measure God's goodness by the broken pieces of our life lying all around us. But despite Joseph's circumstances that would beg otherwise, later on in chapter 39 we read, but the Lord was with Joseph. His circumstances don't reflect it, but the Lord was with Joseph. His story doesn't look like a good one, but the Lord was with Joseph. He was with him in that prison, and God showed him his faithful love. Once again, what seems to be a common theme for the life of Joseph, life has proved itself to be unfair. But even in the unfairness, God is faithful. Despite all the loss that Joseph has experienced, still somehow, some way, what remains with him sitting there in the valley is God's faithful love. And I can about guarantee if we had a chance to go to Joseph in that moment and said, do you feel the Lord is with you? And he'd say, I don't. I bet if we went to Joseph and, and, and said, hey, does this feel like God's faithful love? I don't think he would say, amen, this feels like God's faithful love. But good thing feelings aren't always factual. Chapter 41 of Genesis tells us that Joseph, while he was still in prison, he became known for being able to interpret people's dreams. Not a lot to do in prison. It seems like one of the fun things to do is, hey, can you, what do you think this dream meant? And Joseph would interpret it, and he got really good at interpreting these dreams. Well, one day, one of Pharaoh's, the, the leader of Egypt, one of his most uh, trusted employees, he's the cupbearer. Uh, he would taste the, 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 the drink for the Pharaoh, and if he didn't kill over in 30 seconds, the Pharaoh knew he could drink it. There's probably a long list of cupbearers. Well, the cupbearer's thrown in prison, and he's there with Joseph, and he's like, I'm having this dream. Do you, do you know what it means? And Joseph, he rightfully interprets it. And the cupbearer, he's going to be released, and Joseph is begging. He says, please do one thing. Do not forget me. You know what I did for you. You're going to be a free man, but please do not forget about me. If Joseph's story is going to turn around, surely this is it. This guy has the Pharaoh's ear. Please don't forget about me. If there's ever a lifeline in, in Joseph's story, this has to be it. This is when everything turns around. And the man walks out of that prison and forgets all about Joseph. And I'm sure Joseph is wondering, where is God in all of this? Two years later, Pharaoh keeps having this unusual dream, this, this unusual set of dreams, and, and, and no one can rightly interpret it. And that cupbearer, who, who apparently is not had a bad taste yet, right? He's still there at the Pharaoh, and, and, and it triggers his mind. I know of somebody who can interpret dreams. And so two years later, Joseph is still in prison, and they go and they grab him, and they, and they bring him in front of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, here's my dreams. Do you, stranger, I don't know who you are, do you know what these mean? And Joseph says, I do know what these mean. Your dreams mean that, that, that there's going to be seven years of abundance in this area. Seven years of abundance. I mean, you're going to be looking at everything you have, the crops, the money, all of it, and saying, God is so good. Look how he's blessing us. But then there's going to be seven years of abundance. Or there's going to be seven years of famine that follows that abundance. Joseph is saying it's going to be real good, but then it's going to get real bad. And so Pharaoh is so impressed. He says, you know what? I believe you're right. He even said, you know, Pharaoh doesn't believe in, in our God, doesn't believe in Joseph's God, but he says, you know what, Joseph, there's something about you. I sense that you have the Spirit of God with you. So you tell us how we're going to survive this. So, so Joseph comes up with this uh, incredible plan as he is put in second in charge over all of Egypt. Now, if you're Joseph, you've got to be thinking, finally, finally those dreams I had came true, right? Finally, like my life has come to fruition. I have been living in the valley, but finally, God is proving His love for me. I get all this prominence. I'm second in charge. Surely all the pain of my past must be way back in the past. 
There's things that, that, that Joseph, you know, he struggles to forgive, but, but now with this prominence and this position, maybe he can forget how bad things used to be. However, the famine is so widespread, guess who comes looking for food? Joseph's older brothers. And like us, there's times when we think our past is in the past. It has no power over us now, and then it rears its ugly head. And just when Joseph thought his past was in his past and God's plan for his life is coming to fruition, his father Jacob sends those older brothers to Egypt looking for food. And little do those older brothers know that they are going to be expecting mercy from someone they showed no mercy to 22 years ago. And so the brothers arrive in Egypt, and it says, although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. They walk into the doors and stare at each other face to face. And Joseph is so far in their past that the brothers don't even recognize their own right in front of them. But but, but face to face, Joseph remembers the pain they brought into his life like it was yesterday. And from here, it it just gets deeply emotional. And how how could it really not? So unrecognized by his older brothers, Joseph accuses them of being spies. He says, you're nothing but a bunch of spies. That's why you're here. You don't need food. You're a bunch of spies. You're wanting to steal from us. And he throws them in prison. If this was a Netflix series, Netflix would be begging you, do you want to continue? Right? And we would because we'd be wondering, is this payback? We'd be wondering, is this, is this revenge? Is this the moment when the brothers get theirs? I mean, what would we do? What would you do? Right? If you had in one hand this, this painful past... Now, now paired with this unbelievable power, you have the future of those who hurt you in your hands. What would you do? So sitting in the prison cell, certainly with a death sentence tagged to their names, we read that the brothers, they were speaking among themselves. They said, clearly, we are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. That's why we're in this trouble. And unbeknownst to to the brothers, Joseph is listening to all of this. And the Bible says that it triggers Joseph so hard that he has to rush out of the room and he starts to weep. All these years later, he still feels the pain from his past, still pulling at his heart like that pain is in the present. Despite 22 years, that that unhealed wound kind of rises to the top like it happened yesterday. And then surprisingly, with with a sign of unwarranted care, Joseph lets his brothers out of prison and and he sends them home with the bags of grain. And when they get home, they, they, they open the bags of grain and there on top is the money they paid for it. You can almost feel Joseph wrestling with himself. Now, eventually, because it's a house full of boys, uh, they run out of food again. And Jacob has to send the older brothers back to Egypt. And still, unbeknownst to the older brothers, they are once again going to beg for food from the man who found no relief when he begged for his life many years ago. And as they throw open the palace doors and they make their way in in, in front of their their, their brother, the Bible says that that Joseph was so moved with emotion by seeing them once again that he had to leave the room. And he went down and he locked himself away in his private room where he started to weep. And it's this cliffhanger of a moment where, where, where Joseph can, and some would even argue he has the right to allow his painful past to dictate everything in his present. 
He, he, he has the right, some would say, to allow that, that pain to drive his thinking, to drive his emotions, his being, his doing. He can do whatever he wants. That pain and his past can dictate everything right now. And in one of the most powerful and beautiful moments of Joseph's painful story, with the brother's fate hanging in the balance, the Bible tells us that, that, that Joseph washed the tears away from his face. He comes into the room and declares, bring out the food. Bring out the food. And he's not talking about bags of grain for a journey. He's saying, bring out the food. This is going to be a feast right here in my palace. And you can almost imagine the, the shock of the waiters as they scurry to get the fine china. No one knows what's happening. Despite all the pain that the brothers have brought into Joseph's life, he is now treating them like honored guests. Honored guests of not just their old, their young, one of their youngest brothers who they don't recognize, but, but honored guests of the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. And they have no idea who he is. These brothers made choices to separate themselves from Joseph. But despite what they've done, despite the years, despite the division, Joseph says, come to my table, eat and drink freely with me. And then sometime later, Joseph gets his brothers alone, and he reveals to them who he is. And as you could imagine, Joseph weeps. And the brothers, they can't make a sound. He just weeps in front of them, and they just sit and watch it not knowing what's going to happen. And finally, they, they, they throw themselves at the feet of Joseph and, and beg for their lives. Now, keep in mind, Joseph has all the authority and all the power at this moment to decide their fate. They are indeed bowing down in front of him like he dreamed all those years ago. He can do whatever he wants he can end their life, and the world would not ask a question about that. But instead, he does something even more powerful. He chooses to break the cycle of division, and he offers forgiveness. And to his older brothers begging, Joseph replied, I'm sure it's behind tears. He says, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. And then the book of Genesis ends with a few of these verses. So Joseph and his brothers and their families continue to live in Egypt Joseph lived to the age of 110. He lived to see three generations of his son Ephraim, and he lived to see the birth of his children of Manasseh's son Machir, whom he claimed as his own. Soon I will die, Joseph told his brothers, but God will surely come to help you and lead you out of this land of Egypt. He will bring you back to the land he solemnly promised to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And that's the book of Genesis. But one of the most essential truths of Joseph's story that we have to understand is that God hasn't changed. Times have changed. God hasn't. People have changed. God hasn't. The world as we know it, it's changed so much. But God hasn't changed a little. And the circumstances of your pain may not be the same as Joseph's, but God is. 
And what we know from the story of Joseph and this God who never changes is that despite your pain, He is still present. Despite your pain, He is still faithful. And when we come to honestly believe that with all of our heart and all of our being is when we will finally get to the point where we stop measuring God's goodness by the ever-changing circumstances of our lives. He is present. He is faithful. That means He is in control even when life feels out of control. His faithful love hasn't left you even when you're in this valley of life and you look around and you feel like you don't have much left. And the gap between our sometimes painful reality, the gap between our sometimes painful circumstances and the promise that God is is with us, that gap is called faith. To know that His faithful love doesn't leave us, even when we don't feel it. We trust that He is with us even when it's hard to see. For some of us, it's, it's time we stop interacting with God like He may have caused our pain. And trust that He is loving and trust that He is faithful enough to bring a purpose to it. Even if that pain is from years ago but feels like it just happened yesterday. What, what people in your life, whether it was yesterday or years ago, the circumstances the world handed you, all of our trauma and all of our our pain are things that that, that the world means for bad. But God can redeem it for good if we let Him have a say in it. And for Joseph, it changed generations of his family. Generations of his family were changed by his faith because he decided to look at his painful past and to say, God, did you have a purpose for this? God, you may not have caused this. I'm going to stop treating you like you did. God, you may not have wanted, you may have been crying with me through this. Your heart may have been breaking while, while mine breaks, but, but God, can we look at this together and, and see how you may have used this for good, even though you didn't cause it? And that type of faith changed generations of Joseph's family. It was just one man deciding that God is good even when life has been so bad. It was just one man looking back on his pain and seeing if God has a greater purpose for it. And that faith, it changed everything. And so we must ask ourselves, what can that faith do for you? What can that faith do for generations of your family who's learning not how you project perfection, but they're learning from how you handle your pain. What will people learn from you? Because you're courageous enough to look back at that thing you're you're trying to bury, but but it's right there like it's yesterday, but you're looking back and saying, God, what can I learn from that? What will they learn from you? Now, if you're a guest with us, uh, I want you to know that that we 